Shalom from Israel. I'm Shira Sokoram, and I want to welcome you to Israel Frontline, your guide to Israel in the Middle East. We want to give you information you will probably not hear in the mainstream media regarding life in Israel and the Israeli-Arab conflict, and we'll add a biblical perspective to our reality. Today, we continue the subject of how Hamas is like ISIS, and ISIS is like Hamas, examining what all terrorist organizations have in common and why the West should not be ignoring their threats. On our program today, who's the father of modern terrorism? Israel's greatest peace offer. Is terrorism here to stay? And later, our panel will once again answer our questions related to Islamic terrorism and fighting it. Do you remember when modern terrorism was birthed? Yasser Arafat, the Palestinian man who won a Nobel Peace Prize, is known as the father of modern terrorism. He was the first to perpetrate hundreds of massive terrorist attacks against civilians in Israel and abroad. It was in the late 1950s that this Egyptian-born man co-founded an organization called Fatah, the Movement for the National Liberation of Palestine. By 1965, his gangs were targeting and bombing Israeli villages, water pipes, and railroads. Fatah destroyed homes and killed Israelis. This was, by the way, before the Six-Day War in 1967, before Jerusalem came into Israel's hands and years before a single Jewish family settled in the West Bank. Soon after the Six-Day War, Arafat's Fatah joined and became the dominant member of the PLO, an umbrella organization of Palestinian terrorist groups. A few months later, he was appointed chairman of the executive committee. The PLO then entered the international arena. On February 21, 1970, he blew up a Swiss Air flight bound for Tel Aviv and killed all 47 passengers aboard. A second plane he bombed on the same day was able to land without crashing. Without so much as taking a deep breath, Arafat went after an Israeli school bus, killed nine children and three teachers, hijacked two more planes, and continued his killing spree. He dispatched members of the Japanese Red Army to Tel Aviv's international airport and killed 27 people. In 1972, his terrorists attended the Olympics in Munich and killed 11 Israeli athletes. I happened to have been there myself at the same time, producing a documentary film on the Olympics for the youth with a mission. Meanwhile, Arafat continued with his passion 21 children and several teachers killed with hand grenades in a small town in Galilee. Raging through the streets, the terrorists killed other civilians at random, including two Arab women. More killings in the town of Beit Sha'an, six shot by terrorists charging into a coastal hotel, 21 dead after Fatah terrorists took over another bus on the Haifa Tel Aviv Highway. So many buses, restaurants, and businesses were attacked that Israelis simply lost count. In 1985, terrorists boarded the Italian cruise ship Achille Laura, shot a wheelchair-bound elderly Jew, and threw him overboard with his wheelchair. In September 1993, Arafat wrote a letter to Israel's Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, stating that from that time on, his PLO accepts Israel's right to exist and commits itself to the Middle East process and a peaceful resolution of the conflict between the two sides. This process was called the Oslo Accords and held great hope in Israel. However, the terrorist attacks did not cease. Encouraged by Arafat's belligerent speeches in Arabic against Israel, 
The Palestinians understood that Arafat's life calling was still intact to destroy Israel. The PLO continued their pursuit of terrorist attacks against Jews, their goal to utterly destroy Israel. One of the most horrendous acts of murder was when a suicide bomber killed 30 participants at a Passover meal at the Park Hotel in Netanya and wounded another 140 people. Near Bethlehem, Arafat declared, we know only one word, Jihad, 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 Jihad. Whoever does not like it can drink from the Dead Sea or from the Sea of Gaza. Until his death, the father of modern terrorism, Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, continued to proclaim Jihad. Oh, my dear ones, he said, in the occupied lands, intensify the revolution and the blessed intifada. We must burn the ground under the feet of the invaders. But that speech was only in Arabic. In English, he preached peace. In Arabic, he declared war against Israel to the bitter end. In the year 2000, under the auspices of President Bill Clinton, Israel's Prime Minister Ehud Barak met with Yasser Arafat at Camp David. Ehud Barak made a serious offer to give Arafat 92% of the West Bank and half of Jerusalem to make peace. Arafat said no. Arafat didn't want to found a Palestinian state, except exactly where the state of Israel now exists. This statement must be repeated constantly. Arafat wanted to destroy Israel. Many years later, his wife Suha revealed that he had told her at that time to remain in Paris because he was about to start a new intifada. In her words, Suha said, Camp David had failed and he said to me, you should remain in Paris. I asked him why and he said, because I'm going to start an intifada. They want me to betray the Palestinian cause. They want me to give up on our principles, and I will not do so. I do not want the friends of Sahwa, which is the daughter of Arafat and Suha, in the future to say that Yasser Arafat abandoned the Palestinian cause and principles. I might be martyred, he said, but I shall bequeath our historical heritage to Sahwa and to the children of Palestine, according to Suha, quoting her late husband. And so Arafat plotted and planned a war that went on for four years, murdering 1,053 Israelis. The Israeli government reported that somewhere around 2,000 Palestinian combatants were killed during that time, 500 of which were killed by the Fatah forces. Muslim against Muslim. It was a terrible time in Israel. I was here. Buses and restaurants blowing up. Israel's emergency volunteers picking up body parts from the floors and streets and from the walls. Only when Israel built the West Bank protection barrier, and in some places it became a wall, did the killings stop. Arafat left his legacy thousands of Jews and Arabs dead, and tens of thousands wounded and maimed. He also left in Arab banks an estimated 1.3 to 6.5 billion dollars to his wife and child. Taxpayers' money from the West, of course. Besides the dead, he left his people nothing. At any time when Arafat was downing planes, or blowing apart Israelis, the democratic nations could have easily stopped the operations of this terrorist organization. Almost any single nation could have ended Arafat's career back then. Indeed, the UN, through threats and condemning resolutions against Israel, made sure that the Jewish people couldn't destroy the PLO. 
Since Arafat was fighting the Jews, he was seen as a freedom fighter and had much favor with not only the Arab world and its friends, but also the so-called enlightened world. After all, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. The world sowed the wind and is now reaping the whirlwind. Former Deputy Director of the CIA, John McLaughlin, observed, the dilemma for Israeli's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, is one that world leaders have always faced when battling extremists like Hamas or the Iran-based Hezbollah. The extremists don't have to win to win. All they have to do is not lose. In other words, if they are still standing at the end of the battle, they will claim they stood up to Israel and then rally recruits for another fight on another day. The West, which is attempting to fight ISIS, should beware and see the parallel. Like ISIS, Hamas is not content with standing still. As long as they are not destroyed, they will continue to fight towards their goal of destroying Israel. In fact, Another round could start at any time because the world will not allow Israel to destroy this destroyer. Already, the Israeli government has warned that Hamas is rebuilding its attack tunnels under its border with Israel and manufacturing more rockets. They will attempt to smuggle in far more advanced weaponry from Iran. It's true that Hamas has fallen on temporarily hard times because its ally, Muslim Brotherhood President Morsi of Egypt, was kicked out. The new president, Abdel el-Sisi, has closed most of the tunnels between Egypt and Gaza through which Hamas brought weapons and raw materials. Nevertheless, Hamas is an extremely dangerous terrorist organization which has the favor of the UN and much of the world and which clearly is preparing for the day of mass killings of Israelis. It may be that Islamic terrorism will play a prominent part in the last day prophecies. The book of Revelation talks about a massive crowd of believers who were beheaded. Islamic jihadists are the only individuals, as far as I know, who are as a regular practice beheading their enemies. Today, in the Middle East, the only answer to this terrible threat is a spiritual awakening among both Jews and Arabs who will cry out to the God of Israel and his son Yeshua, Jesus, to bring a great revival to this land. Maos Israel Ministries is a Messianic Jewish nonprofit organization based in Tel Aviv. We exist to be a witness of the good news to the people of Israel through outreach, discipleship, and raising up godly leaders. We translate and publish outstanding faith books in Hebrew and powerful testimony books to reach non-believers. We have a Hebrew outreach website with original media content produced by our team. We support the Hebrew-speaking congregation Tiferet Yeshua in Tel Aviv. We sponsor and host seminars and conferences. We support our Arab Christian brothers who love Israel and the God of Israel. Our I Stand with Israel Fund serves as a benevolence outreach, meeting the practical needs of Israeli believers. Our dream is to see God's promises fulfilled until the day when all Israel will be saved. We will now turn to our panel. We have Mati Shoshani. It's great to be here from Jerusalem, and Shani Ferguson from Jerusalem. Thanks for having me. And Israel Pachter from Ashdod. So, here are some questions for us to discuss. Shani, what kind of person do you think becomes a terrorist, and why? Is it because of education, poverty, some other reason? I think that question can be split into two uh, what kind of Western person becomes a terrorist, what kind of Middle Eastern person becomes a terrorist. I, I think in Western uh, society, you have someone who is very desensitized to violence, watches movies, plays video games, um, and feels like 
I mean, I want to specifically refer to ISIS because ISIS has been able to um, have Twitter accounts and Facebooks and and all this kind of media savvy taking pictures of violence on the field and the, the battlefield and cats with guns and you know all the fun stuff of everyday life of being a terrorist they've kind of romanticized it. and I think from the Western culture you almost have this like fantasy of I want to be a part of this big movement and change the world just like in the movies on the Mideastern uh, front I think that there's a lot more of fundamental indoctrination where you're just raised with the love and appreciation of death, it's this beautiful thing that you attain, you know, your life is pretty much worth nothing unless you die for some cause. Um, and a lot of that would have to do with education. And they really, they come from a, a perspective of, I, we hate this central thing, we are going to fight against it and we're gonna die for it and our entire people are going to be doing it. They, they kind of feel like this mm -hmm. community of terrorists. What's interesting about Hamas, of course, is that it's mostly uh, Palestinians who are fighting in Hamas, whereas this new uh, phenomenon of in ISIS having so many Westerners come in, I think that that has been part of what has shocked shocked the West. I think in general, terrorist groups have always been about defending their local territory or, or whatever, defending mm -hmm. their local cause, whereas ISIS has kind of been this we are going to take Islam to the world and conquer. So everybody from all over the world is welcome to join. So I don't think mm -hmm. anybody thinks they're welcome to join Hamas and Gaza, right. whereas ISIS is kind of this like, come be a part of us. Right. Well, right. I think they're tapping into something very interesting that's happening in the West, where you have an entire generation of Im children of immigrants who've grown up without any identity. Uh, they're, they're not exactly British or French or German or whatever, and they're you know, distinctly Muslim, distinctly a minority in their country, they're trying to define, and they're tapping in exactly what you're saying. They're creating this ideal. Come and make something worthwhile of yourself, you know. Find your national identity, find your religious identity. Come do something that's of meaning, and they go. And they, they're not sure what it entails, but they know they want to be something. They're taking advantage of exactly that, that need right. of, of self-meaning. I think that really hits home in democratic countries, because if you are growing up in this kind of Western country, it's like, well, what is my one vote? or my one, you know, walking through the streets with a poster when you could be like shooting a machine gun at people in and the Middle East. Yeah, in, in areas where the law won't stop you. Do you think a lot of people are just, uh, don't have a reason to be in the Western world? I mean, I think it's because they do want, I mean, they, they do have this feeling of wanting to They're have wanting purpose. They're wanting something. They're wanting purpose. Okay, so Democrat, you know, I'm, I'm obviously a very pro-democratic kind of person, but the, the feeling that the individual has because there's so much domination and corruption and all this stuff that they would say um, in the democratic system that you just right. kind of feel like even if you do vote, even if you do go out and protest, nobody's really listening. Well, they also, right. I don't think they actually feel part of the country. Right. Because again, these are immigrants. They're not, this isn't, for the most part, not a white Brit. Not especially a, in a, Europe. Right. Especially in Europe. They're, 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 you know, they're distinctly different. They look mm -hmm. dark. They speak with an accent. They're not part of you mm -hmm. know, the homogenous you know, core of society. Right. And they want to find an identity right. and they want to find it somewhere that right. they feel at home and that's where they feel right. accepted. And also I think on some level there's an attack on the ones that do feel like they have an identity. Like if you're an American, don't you know you stole land from Mexico and don't you know that like really your government was evil back in the day and they founded this country and they took it from Indians or whatever, or Native Americans. And, and so you kind of feel like even if you wanted to have an identity, even if you have been there for generations, it's like this thing that you feel ashamed of and suddenly right. here comes this other organization and they're like, we're gonna take over the world. Okay, so there's troubles all over the world, but uh, Israel, tell me, why do world leaders press so hard on Israel to make peace with Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, knowing um, all that's going on and yet they never, hardly ever, and this is, I don't like to say never, but they rarely, rarely ask of the Palestinians anything. It's all Israel needs uh, to give in. Yeah, there's many points in your questions, but I think one of them, the most important one, is the battle, or the, yeah, the battle is spiritual. Uh, you know, we have a Bible, and uh, through the Bible we can see the nature of this conflict. And you know, many times I'm saying, if I would be God, 
I would probably choose for Israel a different land, somewhere in the Europe, you know, in our generation. Switzerland. Switzerland. <laughs> An Perfect. island in the Caribbean. Yeah, the, you know, the God speaks, the Bible speaks about yes. mount, mountains of Israel, Mount of Zion, but, you know, it's just the hills. Yeah. yeah, so for me, you know, growing up in Soviet Union, I've been seeing the uh, different pictures criticizing Israel when they draw in Israel as a knife, put it into the heart of Islamic world. And actually today, as a pastor, as a spiritual person, I understand there is prophetic picture, you know? Uh, so why God have chosen Israel to be right here in the middle of Islam, I really don't know. I mean, I have my opinion, I have a point to say, but generally speaking, I don't know. It's just God's business. So coming back to the situation with the nations, even uh, Western nations in Israel, many times when I uh, watching TV, watching European TV, or even American TV, I see the things they're saying or pressure they put on us, on Israel, it's yes. not rational. And sometimes you, rational. Feel like, you feel like they don't know by themselves why they're mm. acting like that, why they're demanding that such right. a thing. Uh, maybe one of the points, uh, they think that Israel is uh, one of us. It's like Israel is westernized, you know, they are, they should, shall understand us, they should be responsible because they're a modern country, they, they are a democratic country, but of course they're forgetting the context. Mm -hmm. We're not living in the Europe. We're not living, our neighbors, they're not European countries around us. And it's, it's very complicated. Uh, one of the uh, stories I like, I have uh, Arab friends, uh, they are Christians, uh, good, good Christian people. Christian Arab friends. Christian mm -hmm. Arab friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been witnessing once uh, when Western person uh, ask the question, I can give you a name, his name Jamil, and ask Jamil, why uh, it's happened like that? Or what would you say to me about Syria? Who is bad and, and good? You know, who is, the, who is one? Yeah. And he was smiling and he said, you know what, as a, Western, as a Western nurse, you think black and white. But here in the Middle East, things are different. There is not good and bad. It's all bad. He didn't really say that, <laughs> sorry, but just quoting him. It's right. all bad, but now we need to think what is better. Mm -hmm. So I think here is, the, here is the problem, because we see things di in different ways. So right. Europe, many times, they feel like we are one of them. We right. shall listen because we are civilized. We, are, you know, we have a law. We, have a, we can compromise. Right. And they're not really expecting the Palestinians or many right. others around us to act the same way. Yeah. This is why pressure you is know, always on Israel. When I, uh, when I hear the news, now I know the, the Bible says for us not to worry about anything. But the thing that uh, is so upsetting to me is when I hear how the UN is coming against Israel, how England is coming against Israel, how the leadership in the United States is coming against Israel. And it, you just, because it's not reasonable. It's simply not reasonable. So that's where, that's where that is. I really do agree with you that it is a spiritual, spiritual situation. I'd like to add to that, that I think that it actually proves that deep down inside these Western countries or the UN or whatever, mm -hmm. they really see Israel as a morally superior entity because I don't ask my five-year-old to drive a car because I know it's impossible. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to ask Hamas to be civilized because they drag their people through the streets and that's mm -hmm. what they call a court case and, you know, justice or whatever. Right. So they, they look at Israel and they're like, look, you guys are decent people. You should do ABC. But Hamas, I mean, you know, work with them. Could be. Could be. In fact, it's a well-known phenomenon that the Muslim leaders say one thing in English for the world to hear while saying the opposite in Arabic, inciting their people to hatred and violence against Israel. Mati, Mati, why do they do that? And why does the West not see? Don't they get translators? Don't the governments of, of the West, don't they translate these speeches of, of hatred towards Israel and they just listen to the English version? I think the answer is obvious. They do. And they have the information in hand that they choose to ignore it. And perhaps this is a good opportunity for everyone to sort of be, you know, be enlightened about the reality of leadership in, you know, in democracies. Mm -hmm. These people are not making decisions based only on what is the right thing to do. They're looking at their country's interest. They're looking at their own personal interest. I'll give you an example. John Kerry, who I personally, you know, he, he seems to have done very well in American politics. He has not done well at all, and that's a compliment in the Middle East. 
he's done miserably in the Middle East. Not only that, American foreign policy in the Middle East has done very poorly under him and... And uh, give an example of why So, so an, exa an example, he knows these things. Uh -huh. And yet he comes back, he's pounding away at Israel. Yes. You know, you have to do this. And at the same time, he knows the Palestinians are saying, we're never going to give in. We're never going to submit to your will. And, and then in English, they say, oh, we want to cooperate. We're trying to work with you, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. He knows the reality of it. He's not a foolish person. Mm -hmm. He's educated. What is his personal interest? Perhaps he wants to be president. Perhaps he wants a Nobel Peace Prize. There's always something else. You have right. to look behind right. the scenes for what they're trying to get. Because in. I was trying to figure out, during the war, here Israel had just found all these tunnels, many of them going into Israel with plans to slaughter Israelis. And Kerry knew this very well. And yet he said, no, let's have a ceasefire right now while the, the, while the tunnels were still there. I just I, couldn't understand I, it. I think Kerry's, you know, he really has something personal against Israel and on certain issues. And at the same time, you just I think we, we've talked about this before, they just have trouble recognizing how evil the Hamas is. Yeah. They, don't, they don't reconcile the fact, they can't, it doesn't click in their mind. Right. These people are purely evil. They truly invested all their resources as a nation in creating a war mechanism. It just doesn't make any sense to them. Right. So they say, no, no, it, there must be something yeah. else. It must right. be Israel's fault right. somehow. Right, right. Well, I believe that's all we have time for today. Thank you, panel, for being with us, and we'll see you next week. The Ma'oz Israel Report, the magazine you've loved for years, is now easier to read than ever. Introducing the Ma'oz Israel Report app for iPad. All the same great articles you get in the print edition, plus video reports and exclusive bonus photos you won't find anywhere else. There are also archived editions and translations into eight languages. You can even connect with Ma'oz Israel on Facebook and Twitter, or make a donation to the ministry, all right on your iPad. Best of all, it's free. To download, go to Apple's App Store and search Ma'oz Israel. The Ma'oz Israel Report app for iPad, putting Israel right at your fingertips. That concludes today's episode of Israel Frontline. Thank you for watching. For more articles about Israel, sign up for the free Maoz Israel Report at maozisrael.org slash sign up. Please join us next week for another episode of Israel Frontline. On behalf of our team and myself, Shalom from Tel Aviv.